all for coming. I'll just start with a couple of brief remarks, and then the rest of the evening's yours. Uh, I, I'm getting an awful lot of calls about Obamacare. Uh, all I can do is tell you that this was exactly what we had warned would happen for years. Uh, according to the latest numbers, about six million Americans have lost the health plans that they were promised that they could keep. About two million have found uh, plans under Obamacare. About 50 percent of the Obamacare um, uh, uh, website visitors are put into Medicaid, which is the poverty program. Uh, there was a major study on Medicaid medical outcomes. Uh, you have about the same medical outcome being on Medicaid as you have not being insured at all. And uh, just to underscore that point, I had my uh, office check around uh, our, our district offices in Granite Bay, which is in the Roseville area. So I had them call down the Roseville telephone directory looking for general practitioners who would accept Medicaid patients, Medi-Cal here in California. Uh, uh, out of 40 general practitioners, four would accept Medicaid patients. Um, and the earliest you could get an appointment was two weeks. Uh, I then had them check around for veterinarians. A veterinarian, every veterinarian would see your dog, and the longest you had to wait was uh, the following morning. That's what Medicaid is, and about half of the uh, folks that are going to the Obamacare sites are being pushed into Medicaid. Some of them, who've been scrimping and saving to stay, stay out of Medicaid, who bought uh, catastrophic policies uh, that are now deemed unworthy under Obamacare uh, because they didn't want to get forced into the Medicaid uh, uh, program and they find against their will that they are anyway. I mean, the, 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 and, and this is un unfortunately just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, what we're going to see next is people going to doctors and finding out those doctors are no longer uh, uh, in the Obamacare exchanges. Um, in fact, there was a, uh, a shocking statistic that I believe came from the California Medical Association that suggested that a large, large number of California doctors simply be in the Obamacare exchanges. So we're going to find out the doctor, they, not only could they not keep the policy they liked and were promised they could keep, they're also going to be told, uh, by the way, you can't keep your doctor either. Uh, we are also expecting, the, the, the first wave of cancellations was those in the individual market. We are expecting another big wave of cancellations among those uh, who get their um, insurance through their employer. In fact, I believe uh, Walmart, or is, was it Target? I guess Target yesterday or the day before just announced that they were dropping their health ca uh, care. Uh, people have been cut back now to 29 hours by businesses that are struggling to cope. There's even a name for them now, 29ers. Uh, technically, by the way, they're still employed. So if, if they're called by the Labor Department on an employment survey, they're employed. But they've been cut back to 29 hours uh, because of Obamacare. I mean, it's just one nightmare after another. What will happen next is another round of major rate increases uh, because they don't have the mix of patients necessary to actuarially support uh, the program. Um, so it's, it's, it's bad now, but it is going to get a great deal worse. I frankly don't see any way to, to fix it. If you try to fix one part of it, you make another part worse. If you try at this point, now that it's gone into effect, to delay the mandate, what you end up with is fewer people in the program to subsidize the costs and therefore even higher and higher premiums and you enter this rate spiral uh, uh, that will bring down the program. What we are watching, I am afraid, is the collapse of the American health care system, which for all of its flaws, uh, still offered the most affordable, the most accessible, and by far the most advanced medicine in the world. Uh, uh, and instead of fixing the problems, we threw the baby out with the bathwater. The Republicans, unfortunately, have not put their reform package through the House. We, we do have a reform package that um, uh, uh, puts the patient back in charge of their health care uh, by, among other things, taking all of the tax advantages we currently give to companies to buy plans for their employees, why don't we give those same tax advantages to the employees themselves so that they can go out and choose a plan that best meets their own needs? Why don't we let them shop across state lines for the best policy to meet those needs so they can find it in another state? Why is it that we, we don't expand the health uh, savings account so that people can meet their health care expenses with pre-tax income? Of, uh, you know, why aren't we going after the cost drivers that are forcing costs up like, like uh, medical malpractice? And why aren't we dealing rationally with pre-existing uh, uh, conditions? Um, that's what the Republican plan does. But I am sorry to tell you that we have not moved that off the House floor. We, we have a majority in the House. I think we would have 
a solid majority in favor of the reform, but leadership has not moved it off the House floor. We're going to have a conference next week in Maryland, and I'm going to be beating that drum just as hard as I can. The other thing we're getting tons of calls on is just the lousy economy. And uh, it is so damn frustrating. This is now the fifth year of these policies. We warned they would not work. These have not been happy years for our country, and they have not been prosperous years for our country, despite record amounts of stimulus spending. Uh, you know, we warned at the time that that stimulus spending would not only not help the economy, it would hurt it. And it, it, it hurts it because... Every dollar that government injects into the, you know, the, the, the whole point of the stimulus uh, programs was, well, we're just going to take a ton of money and we're going to pump it into the economy. And that's going to mean extra dollars in people's pockets and they'll go out and spend those dollars. And that's going to jumpstart consumer spending and get this great economy going again. The problem is that half of the, half of the theory works. If I take a dollar from Peter and give it to Paul, Paul's got an extra dollar to spend. He's going to take that dollar into a shop. He's going to spend it in the shop. The shopkeeper's going to order more product. The manufacturer's going to order more, more uh, resources. Uh, that part works. The problem is they completely forget the other half of the equation. Peter now has one less dollar to spend in that very same economy, one less dollar to ripple through. A government cannot inject a dollar into the economy unless it first takes that same dollar out of the economy, and that's what they're doing, and they've been moved a huge amount of capital from the private sector that invests money based on the highest economic return of the dollar to the government sector that invests it on the highest political return of the dollar, and those are often two very, very different things. That's the difference between Apple and Solyndra. It's the difference between FedEx and the post office. It is a mistake that we have made before and that we are repeating. The good news is we know how to revive an economy. We have done so many times before. You know, when people say this is the worst economy since the Great Depression, how many of you, not you, you scouts probably don't remember, but I bet a lot of other folks remember a day when we had double-digit unemployment, double-digit inflation, we had mile-long lines around gas stations, interest rates were at 21%. Why don't we remember those days? It's because they didn't last very long. That was the end of the Carter administration. Ronald Reagan came in. You remember his diagnosis. He said that in this great economic crisis, government is not the solution to our problems. Government is the problem. He cut back on the tax and the regulatory burdens that were crushing the economy, and he produced a period of expansion of, the, of, 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 of prosperity uh, un unparalleled in modern times. And by the way, it wasn't just Reagan, and it wasn't new to Reagan. John F. Kennedy did the same thing in the early 1960s with the same results. Bill Clinton, after the drubbing he took in 1994, remember his, uh, his announcement, the era of big government was over? He made good on that. He cut federal spending by 4% of GDP, which is miraculous. Uh, Reagan cut it by only one or two. Clinton cut it by four. He attacked entitlement spending. He abolished the open-ended welfare system we had at the time. He signed what amounted to the biggest capital gains tax cut in American history, turned in the only four budget surpluses in the past 50 years, and we had a period of profound economic expansion. Uh, 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 Harry S. Truman, 1945. Uh, abolishes the excess profits tax, slashes uh, federal income tax rates. In fiscal year 1946, Harry Truman cut the federal budget from $85 billion down to $30 billion in a single year. He fired 10 million federal employees. It's called war demobilization. The Keynesians at the time predicted 25% unemployment and a second Great Depression. Instead, we got the post-war economic boom. So we know how to revive an economy. We've done it before. We also know how to tank an economy. We've done that before. George W. Bush increased spending by 2% of GDP, turned in what at the time were record budget surpluses. We look back on them, they look rather quaint in comparison, but at the time they were absolutely reckless. Uh, uh, he presided over the biggest expansion of entitlement spending since the Great Society. Uh, and uh, how did that all work out? I mean, so, so we know what works, we know what doesn't work. The problem is we're pursuing policies that we know don't work. And Reagan was right. Government's not the solution to these problems. Government is the problem. I mean, right here in this region, we just had 400 square miles of uh, national forest destroyed by fire. 
The reason for that is we've had an 80% decline in timber harvesting in the Sierras in the past 30 years. And as the, as the timber harvest has gone down, the acreage burned by fire has gone up proportionally. If you look at the two charted on a graph, it is the most remarkable cause and effect relationship I think you can see in a graph. Um, one forester put it this way, he says, you know, all of that excess timber is going to come out of the forest one way or another. It's either going to be carried out or it's going to be burned out, but it's going to come out. When we carried it out, we had much healthier forests and we had a thriving economy. Uh, since we have stopped carrying out because of government regulation, cut uh, a timber by 80%, now the forests are badly overgrown. They are susceptible not only to pestilence but to devastating fire. Um, and now, with those trees destroyed by fire that could likely have been prevented or at least minimized by proper forest management, we can't even get the dead trees off the public land so that we can salvage them and raise the money necessary to reforest the, uh, the, the forests. It is absolutely insane. Of, uh, uh, Sierra Pacific has about 16,000 acres of private land that was also destroyed by the fire. They have been salvaging their timber around the clock because they're not hampered by these regulations. They're already 50% done with the salvage of their entire lands. They'll be finished by summer. Of, of they, um, uh, and, and meanwhile, we won't even have the environmental reviews done on the public lands uh, until uh, uh, late summer of this coming year. And then the litigation starts, and time is of the essence, because uh, after a year, the timber loses much of its value, and after two years, it's completely worthless. So that public resource, it could be used to raise the money, not, not, only, not only to provide an economic boom for the region, get, get the, the, keep the mills running, meaning, meaning uh, you know, economic activity across the region, uh, it would also mean millions of dollars that we could then use to, to replant those forests. And the sad fact is, a couple of years from now, the private lands that were properly managed are going to be blooming with new forest, and the public lands are going to be converted to scrub brush. This is just insane. You can go through every sector of the economy and watch this kind of insanity. Uh, you know, we, we now have this, uh, this, this terrible water crisis. Um, It is so frustrating. We have not built a new uh, uh, major reservoir in California since 1979. That was the new Malonis Dam. Um, everybody, you know, the Colorado is the mother load of all water in the western United States. The Colorado River is a junior sister to the Sacramento. The Sacramento actually has 20% more water flow than the Colorado. The difference is we store 70 million acre feet on the Colorado River. We only store 10 million acre feet on the Sacramento River. Uh, if we had the Auburn Dam that was half, con actually the major part of that was constructed. Uh, the, uh, the footing for the uh, dam, the diversion tunnels were all cut out of solid rock. That's the tough part. All they had to do then was pour the concrete. Uh, we walked away from that mid-construction because of environmentalist objections. Uh, they're now pushing to, to tear down perfectly good dams on the Klamath River. Um, had that been completed, we would have 2.3 million acre feet of additional water for this region. Uh, that's enough for more than 2 million households. 800 megawatts of clean, cheap hydroelectricity, that's enough for more than a million households. Delta, all the billions of dollars that we're pouring into levees, that's for 200-year flood protection. The Auburn Dam by itself would be 400-year flood protection. Um, the, these, these policies are insane. The only good news I can offer you on this is that, that we've not been struck down by some mysterious act of God. These are all acts of government. They are within our power to change. And I do think that today the American people coming to that conclusion very rapidly. We're seeing it in the polling data across the board. So I am very uh, confident uh, that we are going to see some major changes in the next few years. I can't predict uh, that we're going to see much out of, uh, out of this remaining session of the 113th Congress. The House has sent about 150 major pieces of legislation over to the Senate. They've virtually all been killed. Um, that is a uh, a frustration to us all, but it's also a reflection of the country. The Congress is divided right now because the country is divided. 
Um, and the Congress is merely a reflection of the country. But I do believe that, um, that the country is rapidly awakening to the damage that these idiotic policies have caused. Uh, and I think that we're about to see a new dose of common sense uh, restored to governance, uh, not by any act of government, but by an act of the voters in changing the government. So thank you all very much. That's, that's my spiel. The rest of the evening is yours. Thank you again. <coughs> yeah. Oh, 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 yes. Okay, but uh, I, I, uh, Tom's going to need that microphone taken to them. So, if we could just, Kim, if you could just grab, yeah, Kim, if you just grab the microphone. Uh, what we normally do at these, we uh, we usually have larger venues, so um, uh, we kind of pass the uh, the microphone around. Kim, so get Kim's attention um, to make a comment or ask a question. Go ahead. I don't think I don't think that's plugged into the uh, PA system. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yell at the kids, right? Um, my question it kind of goes to um, the REM fire, and it kind of circles about my husband and I. We have a welding company and a logging truck. Want to see pictures of recovery from SPI land right here? Um, right now. Our truck, we are going through the fun, the fun task of dealing with CARB, as I'm sure of any other truckers or um, companies. What we're finding is that the more work that we try to get out and, and to do recovery, they're shutting us down because now we're shutting trucks down yeah. due to this CARB, EPA. I have to exchange my son's college fund for an updated motor for 2010 for our peat that we pay for owned outright, no loans for our business. We're doing it the American way. Mm -hmm. Yet yeah, we've got um, regulations telling us that you're doing it wrong, we want it this way. Mm -hmm. But by the new map showing, CARB has 90% of California in an exempt area. Where does it stop and what do we do? We put out thousands of dollars just for a moto It stops. Border. Yeah, it stops when we stop it. I, how do we fight this? Well, it's you know, ultimately, you know, people have to understand the cause and effect, and the best way to fight it is to tell your story like you are right now in every single forum you can find. Uh, email it to your friends, write letters to the editor, do exactly what you're doing now. Stand up at public meetings and talk about it. People have got to understand. I think a lot of this is stemming from AB 32, yeah. which was this moronic act by uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger to save the planet from global warming. Now, I don't want to get into a long discussion on that. I will simply observe I believe in global warming. It, the, globe, the planet has been warming on and off since the last ice age. Cycle. Yeah, there was, there was a period 15,000 thousand years ago or so when this area was under a glacier. Well, yes, the planet's been warming, but it's not because of your truck. Right. Uh, what, they have, what they are doing to the economy is absolutely criminal. Um, in, in fact, I've talked to uh, uh, refinery managers in both northern and southern California to ask them how they're dealing with AB 32, which again requires a dramatic reduction in carbon dioxide emissions. In fact, you could take every car off the road and not meet the AB 32 requirements. That's how radical and ridiculous it is. Um, uh, uh, what they're telling me, is, I, I, so I, I call them, I, I say, well, how are you guys dealing with AB 32? Oh, we can get through this year, but you know, in 2015, we'll be shutting down. We have to shut down. Mathematically, there's no possible way we can deal with it. Um, think about what happens when all the refineries in California that make the California-specific fuels are no longer there. What's that going to do to our gas prices? I mean, this is just, this is absolutely insane. And, and, it, and, and it is, unfortunately, the lunatic fringe of our society has been in control of these policies now for the past 15 or 20 years because... As, as Edmund Burke said, men and women of goodwill have done nothing. Well, we've got to start doing something now, or, or this is just the tip of a very ugly iceberg. Thank you. But so, so again, tell your story. Your, your, everybody within your ability to communicate has got to understand the impact of these laws. And in fact, I had that very discussion with SBI. Their biggest, uh, the, the biggest problem in, in, in their salvage operation is trucks. Yeah. Well, and that's just it right now. Yeah. The, the state's requiring them to collect the exempt um, yeah. certificates. Well, with that, you have, we have to go in and tell them, okay, well, we're still exempt because we, we're good until 2015. Yeah. And by the way, what they're also... 
What they're also telling me is it is putting huge trucking companies out of business. There are a lot of them that are shutting down and leaving California, which means that your product transport prices go through the roof uh, to cover all of these costs. It, 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 it's in, uh, it, it is a spiral that we have got to stop. And again, there's one bit of good news. We can stop it any time we summon the political will to do so. Anyone else have? Okay. <coughs> we can't summon the will to change this if we give amnesty to millions upon millions of illegal. <coughs> excuse me, I'm getting over the flu. Illegal aliens, mm -hmm. and I don't understand what Speaker Boehner is doing with proposing a mass amnesty because mm -hmm. the middle class is getting hit so hard with unemployment, mm -hmm. underemployment, and Obamacare, some of these EPA rules. Where does it stop? And Boehner is as much of an enemy, I think, to the middle class as any of the Democrats in the House or even in the Senate. Well, I know a lot of the Democrats in the House and the Senate, and I can tell you they are a much bigger threat than John Boehner, but I do agree with your frustration <laughs> over this. Um, the, the, we're told that we need a balanced approach. We need amnesty for those who are here, and then uh, uh, tougher borders, then we will secure our borders and make it illegal for, for those who are illegally in the country to, to work. We're going we're gonna to have very stern uh, 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 laws uh, to prevent future illegal immigration. That's the balanced approach that they're proposing. The only problem with that is that was exactly the 1986 Immigration Reform Act that Ronald Reagan signed when we legalized the then three million illegal aliens in the country. Uh, we were promised we were going to secure our borders, build the border fence, and make it illegal to hire illegal aliens. With the amnesty took effect with a stroke of a pen. We never got the border reforms under both Republican and Democratic presidents, and now we're being told, uh, given that sorry record, um, to do a balanced approach, legalize the 11 to 20 million illegal aliens that are now in the country um, uh, in exchange for tougher border security. We're supposed to believe that the government that has refused to enforce our current laws can be trusted to enforce even more stringent laws in the future. That is absurd. Our, you know, our immigration laws were not <laughs> written to keep people out of our country. Most countries have immigration laws specifically written to do so. Ours were written to assure that when people come to our country with a sincere desire to become Americans, <laughs> when they acquire a common language and a common culture and a common appreciation of American constitutional principles, when they renounce their re allegiance to their former country and adopt America as their own, um, uh, they're welcomed to this country. Our immigration laws are written to promote assimilation. That's the only way you can create one great nation from all the nations of the world, which is what America is. Illegal immigration undermines the process of assimilation that our immigration laws were written to serve in the first place and that form the foundation of a nation of immigrants. Um, you know, we can talk about the economy, and the impact that's going to have on, on uh, you know, when, when we already have three Americans looking for every open job, uh, uh, opening that up to, to mass illegal immigration uh, is going to exacerbate the problem dramatically. We can talk about that. We can talk about the economic impact on our, um, on our social services, which the Heritage uh, 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 Foundation has estimated to be crushing. We can go through all of that, but that's not the worst of it. The worst of it is it undermines the process of legal immigration. And when people tell me, well, we need a path to citizenship, my response is there is a path to citizenship. It is a path that has been followed by millions of legal immigrants who have obeyed our laws, respected our nation's sovereignty, uh, waited patiently in line, done everything our country's asked of them, uh, uh, while 11 to 20 million illegal aliens cut in front of them. Um, the people I find who are the maddest about illegal immigration are those legal immigrants who have obeyed our laws and are now wondering why did we go through all of that if we could have just walked across the border, thumbed our nose at American sovereignty, and be given amnesty. Ah. 
Yes, uh, uh, can you uh, comment on the new rules that the IRS are coming up with to uh, for the uh, 501c4s? Yeah, basically they want to silence dissent. I mean, that's what it comes down to. I mean, for generations, we have recognized that civic groups that are participating in the public policy debate serve an absolutely vital public purpose. That's, that's, that's how our country is guided. It's guided by a great discussion that goes on among the American people. The groups that, that, that promote this public policy discussion from the right and the left are absolutely integral to that process. Of, uh, so we, you know, we, we exempt them from taxation. Um, and again, mainly you know, these are groups that pass around the hat at meetings just to pay for the rental of the hall. Um, uh, to, to, to suddenly suggest uh, that, uh, uh, that, that these groups can no longer participate in the public policy debate, that individuals cannot pool their resources to participate in that debate, to buy an ad in the newspaper, to buy an ad on local cable or, or, or radio, of, uh, is, 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 is going to links that George III never dared to go. George III never dared to, to, um, uh, to, to, to tax public assemblies. But our government is now proposing to do so. And that's only after they tried to shut down the Tea Party through, through uh, intimidating tactics that, that are anathema to any free society. Will there be pushback? Uh, I sure hope so. Yeah, there'll be pushback from me. I can guarantee one member's going to be pushing back, and I'll bet quite a few others will as well. Hey, if the Republican candidate for 2016, as a campaign pledge, promises to repeal Obamacare, should we believe that candidate, or just is, is, is Obamacare here to stay? Uh, oh, no, I, I, I think Obamacare is about to collapse on its own. In fact, I, I think it will probably collapse before 2016. Uh, it would not surprise me if it drives the election of 2014. I suspect we will have a big shift in the Senate. Um, uh, and it would not surprise me, given, given what we now see unfolding, uh, that a repeal measure on a bipartisan vote goes through the House and the Senate, and if the president vetoes it, it would, it's certainly within the realm of possibility there would be the votes for a veto override. I mean, that's how acute the situation is becoming, how rapidly it is becoming. And don't forget, the Republicans are absolutely united in opposition to uh, Obamacare. Not a single Republican voted for it. The bipartisan vote was the Democrats. We've had 30 to 40 Democrats uh, in the House shift sides and, and vote with the Republicans on these Obamacare issues. So, so something is going on out there, and it's huge. Uh, and, and as far as believing a candidate, um, somebody once asked uh, Newt Gingrich, well, why should we trust you? And his response was, you shouldn't trust me. You should never trust anybody that you loan power to. If you're going to loan power to somebody, you'd better watch them like a hawk. <laughs> yeah. Back to immigration, if we can, mm -hmm. for just a minute. I, I just was looking it up. That New Bloomberg News is reporting, this was last August, that here in California, agriculture, big ag, especially in the Central Valley, is saying without the Mexican workforce, they don't have the workers to pick the crops. I wanted to know your reaction to that. And secondly, what would you specifically do about 12 million illegal workers who are in this country at this time? Do we send them home on buses? I mean, what what is the answer? Well, I, I, I think that you know, it's two, two issues on the agricultural labor issue. First of all, um, it, you know, when they say, well, there aren't Americans to do the work, we're paying people more not to work than to work full time at the minimum wage. Why would we be so surprised that they're choosing not to work? Uh, that's issue number one. Issue, so, so, you know, we, we need continued reform of this welfare system. Uh, second point uh, is that, you know, to the extent that when, when we reach full employment, when, when these jobs actually are going wanting for workers, then we have a model, the Bracero program, uh, in which uh, uh, immigrant workers cross the border legally, leave a deposit as they cross the border with the federal government, 
uh, come up here uh, uh, under the full protection of American laws, uh, work under the protection of those laws, and at the end of the season, return to their country of origin, uh, picking up their deposit on the way out. Uh, that is a system that works and works well and that I will endorse once we get our unemployment back under control. But as long as there are so many Americans looking for work to say, oh, we can't find good workers, I don't buy that for a second. Anyone else have a question? Hi, I, a story broke today that the environmental agency, some some folks within it, were colluding with some environmentalist groups well, to stunned. stop the Keystone pri Pipeline. But they've got the emails to prove it. Yeah, yeah. What can we do about that? Uh, what can we do about collusion at the EPA? Yeah. I mean, uh, I'm sorry, but I'm just not shocked by that. We've known all along that, that they've colluded. Isn't, isn't that against the law? I mean, can't, isn't there a conflict of interest with... Yeah, I mean... Or is it simply a question of like-minded people getting together to accomplish something? No, I, 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 we've observed this for years. And, and, and you're right to be outraged about it. And you're right to, to, to say, well, here's the smoking gun. Now what are you going to do about it? You're absolutely right on that. Um, you know, with respect to the EPA and a lot of these agencies, a couple of points. First, I think they have acquired way too much uh, a power. Um, the Constitution very clearly gives to Congress and Congress alone the authority to legislate. It does not give that authority to the executive branch. There are seven articles in the Constitution. Uh, Article I, establishing the Congress and enumerating the powers of the Congress, takes up half of the Constitution. The second article establishes the presidency. Most of that, by the way, uh, regarding the election of the president, the, the central portion of the president's responsibility is to take care that the laws be faithfully executed. Um, for executive agencies to be legislating a volume ten times greater than Congress is a direct affront and threat to the Constitution and to its separation of powers that has kept us free. Um, another point on the EPA. Uh, not only do I believe that they have greatly usurped powers the Constitution limits to the Congress, um, they're also operating largely without authorization. There, there, there's a two-step process in spending the public's money. The first is the authorization. There is a program that is authorized for a period of time to accomplish certain things. Only once it is authorized is the Congress then supposed to be allowed to appropriate. Since the 1830s, the Congress has been forbidden, or actually the House specifically, has been forbidden to appropriate monies except for purposes authorized by law. Well, about one-third of our discretionary spending is now unauthorized. And the EPA's authorization, most of it uh, has lapsed years ago. It's never been reviewed. I've been pressing a reform that essentially says, uh, and, and by the way, the, the reason why they're getting away with that, every member of the House under the House rules for over 100 years has had the right to object. A single member can raise a point of order that this appropriation is going for a purpose not authorized by law. The problem is when these appropriation bills are brought to the House floor, um, that right is waived in the rule that brings it to the floor. So even though I've got the right to do it, I cannot exercise the right to object. What I've said is we ought to give all of the authorizing committees one year to go through all of their programs, decide which ones to reauthorize, which ones to scrap, and which ones to reform, and after that, restore the right of members to object to unauthorized appropriations. That would force a top-to-bottom review of the EPA uh, which I th and, and a lot of other programs that I think is long overdue. I'm sorry, that was a lot of inside baseball, but it, it gets to the... Yeah. Hi. Um, sometimes, not only here in Amador County, where we are fairly conservative, but I've lived in, in Southern California other places. I've been a public school teacher for 16 years, and as a conservative in public schools, I always feel like I'm the bad guy. I do not like the union. I don't believe in tenure. I know the educational funding or funding of the education system is broken. 
How do we fix the funding of the educational system? I can handle the teaching part. How, yeah. do, we, how do we fix the funding part of, of education? Well, the, the, the funding part is not the problem. I mean, we're spending three times, in, here in California, the anyway, last time I checked, we were spending three times inflation adjusted what we were spending a generation ago for the public schools per, per pupil. Um, so it's not a funding issue. The problem is the management. The management of the public schools has changed radically. You go back to the 1950s, um, and, and, and I experienced a lot of that in the, uh, you know, when I was going to school in the 1960s here, teachers were in charge of the classroom. The teacher had the professional authority to decide the, you know, what curriculum best met the individual needs of the students. The teacher had a huge uh, latitude in selecting the, uh, the coursework and the, the appropriate books. And the teacher was held accountable by a principal who had the authority to hire and fire, who could tell a non-performing teacher to shape up or ship out, who could pay a good math and science teacher more than a good gym teacher, not because we don't like gym teachers, but because good math and science teachers cost more. Uh, and the principal had a local school board breathing down his neck to be sure that he did that. If a parent had a complaint, the principal had the authority to act upon that complaint. All of that power, at least much of that power, has been shifted to Sacramento and Washington, and with it the accountability and with it the good management. I think we ought to put the teachers back in charge of their classrooms, put the principals back in charge of their teachers, put the school boards back in charge of their principals, and then call it a day. Uh, that's a system that worked and worked very well. Yeah, yeah, you know, and restore to the teacher the, prof the, 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 the professional authority to make these decisions and hold the teacher accountable for the results of, of, of that exercise of authority. And by the way, give them back control of their classrooms. There was nobody closer to God on earth than a teacher in his classroom in those days. Yeah. Yes, sir. You were saying that you thought uh, the um, Obamacare was going to collapse of its own weight, and that that worries me. That's a passive approach. Worries me because uh, I keep reading that uh, there is in the law the ability to bail out the insurance companies when yeah. they when they get into trouble. So it, it, we don't have this descending spiral. I, it seems like something. I mean. Bad programs just oh, don't yes. go away unless we really. Oh yeah, yeah, no, no, you're problems. absolutely right on that. The the the, the, the insurance company bail. You know, the insurance companies colluded on all of this. They saw, oh great, we can get government's going to enforce more people to buy our products, um, uh, 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 and they got a bailout provision in there so that if this thing starts to go under as it now has, it's the taxpayers that pick up their losses for their program that they colluded in. Uh, uh, I am adamantly opposed to that. There is legislation that I am co-sponsoring, along with a lot of other House members, to repeal that provision of Obamacare. Um, I really think that we need to press that and press that hard. Uh, uh, I think every representative ought to go back to his people and, and explain how is it that you think that we ought to be bailing out these insurance companies from their losses. Uh, I think it would be awfully hard to explain to folks. So, yeah, I mean, I agree with you completely on that. Uh, uh, the, the, the bailout of the insurance companies is appalling. And it shouldn't be allowed to happen. Yeah, Arnie? I got the mic. Well, first of all, your, your response to the school teacher was A+. Plus. Oh, well, <laughs> thank you. Okay. Uh, and, but there's, there's, a, there's a spillover here because what Dr. Harder just said about medicine is the same problem. Mm -hmm. You were talking about the teacher. You could just as well substitute the doctor. Right. And we have the same type of situation. So, mm -hmm. so you know, what we're seeing basically is wherever whether this education or health or the forest, we're seeing all this top-down management yeah. from the government, this super concentration of power in the executive and the frustrated legislature yeah. to deal with it. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's, it's obviously frustrating to you as it, as it is to us. Uh, I'm wondering, do you have any thoughts about whether you think that the court, the Supreme Court, is going to be able to engage in a number of decisions in the next year which are going to put some balance back? Or, and if not, then where are we at? Well, <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that's a really tough question. I mean, as, as you know, the, the, um, the Supreme Court is also badly divided right now. I think that the uh, Roberts decision on Obamacare was an absolute travesty. And it, and it goes far beyond Obamacare. I mean, basically, there was a good part and a bad part of the decision. The good part was he said that the federal government has no authority to force people to buy a product. And, and, and a majority of the court agreed with that. But then he went on to say, but 
In the case of Obamacare, the, the instrument of uh, compulsion is not a fine, it's a tax. So you're not forcing people to buy this product with a fine, that would be unconstitutional. But Congress does have the authority to tax, and as long as the instrument of compulsion is a tax, well, that's okay. Now think about what that means. If the instrument of compulsion is a fine, if you run a stoplight, for example, um, you're fined. And, and by the way, fine and a tax, the same thing. Either way, you're depriving people of, of money that they have earned in order to compel them to do something or to restrain them from doing something. Um, if you run a stoplight, you get a fine. A um, couple of things about that fine. Number one, the burden of proof is on the government to prove that you actually ran that stoplight. If the instrument of compulsion is a tax, the burden of proof is on you to prove that you did not run the red light. Secondly, the, the, the government, um, if, if, if it is a fine, you have a right to a day in court before the punishment is levied upon you. You get your day in court before you're punished. If it is a tax, you have to pay the tax before you can go to court. You are punished first, and then you get your day in court. What that does to, to basic fundamental principles of due process, uh, I, I find staggering. And there's not been a lot of discussion about it, but it is really a horrendous decision. So I don't put, I guess it's a long way of saying, I don't put a lot of trust in the court at this point. But remember, the Supreme Court is not the highest court in the land. The highest court in the land is the American people. They are the rightful owners of the Constitution and the ultimate judges of the constitutionality of a measure. Um, if you remember, uh, the, the um, uh, uh, Alien and Sedition Acts under, under uh, John Adams, uh, you know, the most flagrant violation of fundamental rights of free expression that have ever been passed. Those were never overturned by the courts. They were overturned by the election of 1800 and the election of Thomas Jefferson. Um, uh, the, the absolute worst Supreme Court decision, <clears throat> Dred Scott, was not actually overturned by the court. It was overturned by the election of 1860 and the election of, Ron, uh, of, of Abraham Lincoln. Uh, so, I mean, ultimately, I trust that court. Sometime, you know, the Supreme Court has often held the line on the Constitution, but often they've also failed. I don't think that the American people have ever failed us yet. No, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, I have so many issues, I'm not quite sure where to start, but um, let me just talk a little bit about Obamacare. Okay. Um, you made a comment that rates would go up. Mm -hmm. Rates have been going up for years and years, and insurance companies have just allowed them. They have not doubling and tripling. Oh in a yes, they have. Year. When I was working before I retired, I worked for a school district, and sometimes our rates would go up by 14 or 15 percent. These have gone up this by 200 to 300 percent. Um, Mine went up 270. I'm finish? a Kaiser patient. Okay, go can ahead. I finish? Um, Anyways, and you made another comment that we have the best health care in the world. That's not true. Studies have shown that we don't. We have not the high, we have a very high infant mortality rate compared to many of the other countries in Europe. And so we need to do a lot to increase our health care. I have, I know personally many people who now are able to have health insurance who couldn't have it before. Either they had a pre-existing condition they were laid off by their employer and so didn't have a job and couldn't afford health insurance. Mm -hmm. If we repeal this law, and it is a law, if we repeal this law, what do you say that we, to those people? Where, where is your compassion for the people who now are able to have health care who were never able to have it before? Uh, again, government is largely the reason they were not able to get that health care. Let me challenge a couple of points, first of all. Number one, when you say that uh, the United States uh, did not have the finest health care system in the world, let me ask you, where did world elites go to get top-notch health care? They came to the United States. They don't go to Canada or England. The Canadians and the English come here uh, for, for good health care. 
Uh, that's what's being destroyed by Obamacare. When you say, oh, rates have always been going up, well, they have been going up by 10 or 15 percent. Now they're doubling and tripling. I've got a fellow in my office who was forced into Obamacare by the of uh, uh, mid-50s. $700 a month, and that is a story that is being told over and over to our office in hundreds and hundreds of emails that, that we've been getting. Um, you, you know, there, it is true, there are some people who are going to be better off from Obamacare, but very few. The vast, vast majority of people are seeing their rates skyrocketing, they are losing their, the health plans they were promised they could keep, they are losing the doctors that they were promised they could keep. Where is your compassion for all of those folks? Now you're right, there were flaws in the existing system, but a lot of those flaws were manufactured by government. The fact you couldn't shop across state lines for your health care. You can shop across state lines for your automobile insurance. You can shop across state lines for your bank. Why were you restricted only to health care in your state? Um, uh, you know, why is it that you have to pay for your health care with post-tax dollars? You have to pay a tax on them and then uh, uh, what, from what's left over after you pay the tax, you can pay your, your health bill. Why don't we expand the health savings accounts uh, so that people can pay with pre-tax income? Obamacare goes after those health savings accounts. It ultimately destroys Medicare Advantage that gave one-third of Medicare patients a full range of choices over the plan to, to the, the, that best met their own needs. Uh, and with respect to pre-existing conditions, that was a problem. Uh, but it was a government-created problem. That was brought home to me when a fellow came to me uh, after he'd, he'd left his employer, he was starting his own business, he was going into the individual market, he could not find a health plan. The reason he couldn't find a health plan was a pre-existing condition. He had bursitis. He says, I don't care about the bursitis, that's a nuisance. Uh, I'm, I'm worried about something that could bankrupt me. Uh, so write me a policy for everything else, I'll pay for the bursitis myself. And the response was, we would love to write you that policy, but we can't. It's against the law. If we allowed people the freedom to have, the, you know, ha have those plans contoured to their own needs and conditions, then you have shrunk the pool of people who've been denied health care of, 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 for pre-existing conditions that are truly life-threatening to a manageable amount that can then be addressed through a, 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 a pooled risk system the way we do for automobile insurance. Um, it was government that created that problem in the first place. Freedom works. It is time that we put it back to work. And you can spin Obamacare with all of the talking points any way you like. The problem that you're going to face is everybody in this room now has an experience with this. They know how much their health plan has gone up. They know if they've been canceled. They know what they were paying a year ago and what they're paying today. They know whether they were lied to or not when they were told if they liked their plan they could keep it. As as many as 70 million Americans lose their employer paid plans over the next year or so, which is now uh, predicted, uh, you're going to find more and more people with personal experiences. And the argument, who are you going to believe, me or your lying eyes, is not going to work very well uh, for the apologists for Obamacare. The American people now have a real dose of reality. They are forming their opinions based on their own experiences. And I'm sorry, you're not going to be able to spin your way out of it this time. Well, my daughter paid $700. The city of Detroit declared bankruptcy, mm -hmm. and therefore they were not able to pay off the bondholders of the city of Detroit. Mm -hmm. So the bondholders, through their lawyers of course, sued the city when the city evaluated what assets they owned, what could be attacked under bankruptcy laws, the city exempted the money that they had promised to pay retired city workers, mm -hmm. pensions for old people who'd worked their whole life for the city. Mm -hmm. Last week, or two weeks ago, I guess, a judge in Detroit said those pensions can be attacked by the bondholders. The average income for a pension of the workers in Detroit was $19,000 a year. Mm -hmm. Under the new ruling by the judge, those 
pensions can be cut by 85 percent, meaning that an 80-year-old retired Detroit pensioner will be asked to live on $237.50 a month mm -hmm. for the rest of his life. Uh, as a retired federal employee, I get nervous about not just what happens to state-level sure. employees, yeah. but what happens to federal employees. Me Could too. Could you please tell us how you feel about attacking the pensions of people that are already retired? Well, that's, that's the big problem, and I'm worried about it, too. The fact of the matter is we have made promises far beyond uh, the, our ability to meet those promises. Um, and if we continue down the course we're on, every public pension is going to be threatened because there's not the money there to back them up. At the end of the day, the money is not there if we continue down the road we're on. Um, you know, that's why I would suggest that every retired federal and state employee ought to be banging the drums to bring our spending under control now before this entire house of cards begins to collapse because one of the groups that it's going to collapse on are the retirees. You're absolutely right. And that's why we've got to fix this problem now where there's still time. Thanks, Tom, for these meetings. I think they're helpful for everybody. Uh, last September, the EPA, in fact, I think it was, it was some department, declared that we passed, for the first time in human history, 400 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the air. Last time that was like that was three million years ago. Humans have never lived in this environment. Anybody with a child, grandchild, plans to have great-grandchildren should be concerned about that. Mm -hmm. So what do you think? Well, as I said, I think the planet's been warming since the last ice age and it's going to continue to warm until it moves into the next one. The interesting thing is, the interesting thing is it, it comes on and off. For the last 15 years, there's been no global warming. In fact, a, uh, uh, there was a, a celebrated case recently where a group of, um, of uh, global warming enthusiasts went down to uh, uh, Antarctica to document uh, global warming and ended up getting uh, frozen in. The ice cap on the southern pole is currently expanding at a massive level. CO2 is, is, a, is a tiny is a tiny contributor compared to things like water vapor. Uh, and, and furthermore, and by the way, you want to talk about, you want to talk about global warming. Global, you know, try, try um, Googling Mars warming or Jupiter warming or Pluto warming. Pick your favorite planet or former planet and you'll see this going on throughout the solar system, and it probably has a lot more to do with variations in solar intensity uh, than it does in your SUV. So we might be on Saturn someday? No, what I'm, say, what I'm, what I'm, say, what I'm saying is there is a growing... And, and by the way, you know, you're, you're watching... The, science, the, the true scientific community, the real meteorologists, begin turning on this, saying this is a politically driven junk science. The, the, the actual observations do not support it. Uh, and you're watching public opinion beginning to turn, and you're watching public opinion beginning to turn massively against this as they, as, 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 as this, well, no, no, that's common sense reasserting itself. That's, uh, that's this, you know, that's, that's, the, that, that's the story of um, uh, the emperor's new clothes. Finally, some little boy stands out from the crowd and says, that man's not wearing anything. And the rest of the crowd says, yeah, you know, you're right. That's what's happening in this debate. Yeah. Yeah. Um, first, I want to thank you for the work you're doing to get cleaning up the rim fire. Um, also, um, there's a big problem of people are worried about the abuse of the forest by cutting down too many trees. Unfortunately, they've gone to neglect to where you have um, ladder fire uh, materials and stuff that caused the problem, which destroyed 110 designated areas for um, wildlife habitat yeah. that everyone so strongly thinks that we should save, and, and yet they let them burn up because they neglected the forest. Are you guys going to plan on uh, cleaning up the areas so that we don't have the underbrush and the um, high amount of trees that we have there. You know, we went from 80 trees per acre to 800 trees per acre, and it's taking out our water supply, yep. so our lakes are 
are being sucked out dry through the, the abundance of trees, and we're not getting our big timber anymore. So. Well, you know, again, the, the radical environmentalists are telling us we, sh we should leave the forest alone for Mother Nature to recover on her own. But Mother Nature lets fires happen, and we suppress well, we, we the need fires, to understand, which means yeah, we well, don't get the big timber. We need to understand what that policy actually means. It's true the forest will eventually return, but it will be centuries before it returns. What will happen next? with this policy of benign neglect is that scrub brush will have first call on the devastated land. Within a few years, as they're still going through the litigation on salvage of the trees that are now absolutely worthless, uh, uh, you'll have four to five feet of dry tinder built up throughout that area. The next thing that's going to happen is the big destroyed trees uh, are going to start toppling over on that brush. You now have an absolutely perfect fire stack, dried brush on the bottom, big dry logs on the top, uh, and the next lightning strike or careless uh, uh, camper uh, is going to produce a second generation high intensity fire that will absolutely sterilize the soil uh, and, by the way, threaten uh, 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 the forests that were not affected by this fire if they haven't already been affected by a beetle infestation that feeds on this dead timber and in these kind of dry conditions uh, will not be limited to the fire areas. Uh, so that's what they are, that's what they are proposing that we allow happen to 400 square miles of, of the Sierra Nevada. Mm -hmm. These people are out of their minds. I mean, I, I don't know how else to put it. Right, and we really, they need to see that we need to take care of this problem before this happens again. Yeah. Uh, prevention, you know. Well, I, I've already told the Chief of the Forest Service and several of my neighboring Democratic colleagues that the federal management of these destroyed lands will be measured against the management of the private lands. And we're not talking about decades from now. Within a couple of years, the properly managed private lands, which have been salvaged and reforested, will be blooming with new, um, with, with new trees. And the public lands will be brown, dried scrub brush. And that, and, and that is going to be an object lesson for a lot of people, I think. But, but it will be a tragic lesson. Well, yeah. It's a prime example. Yeah. How many years ago in the ages? Exactly it right. Looks destroyed. Yeah. It doesn't look like yeah. No, it will be centuries if 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 we if we succumb to this siren song of the environmental left, it will be centuries before the forest recovers from the Sierra Nevada.